Over the last few years, I've noticed a lot of patterns, in particularly in regards to the personalities of people. Though every human being on our Earth is unique, having different life experiences, beliefs, thoughts and dreams, I couldn't help but notice that a lot of people tend to act in the exact same way. Almost as if, despite the immense differences we all may have, there is a hidden underlying set of personality archetypes that are set in stone across all of humanity. I've been observing and researching the human mind now for many years, but especially so over the last few months. And the results of that is that I've been able to conjure a neat little framework that I like to call The Hexagon Matrix. If I told you that you could fit not just yourself, but all of your friends, family, neighbours, country, and every single person who has ever and will ever live on Earth into just one of nine different archetypes, you'd probably say that I was full of baloney. But that's exactly what we're going to do. So the first question you probably have is, well, Alex, what are these nine archetypes? But hang on a minute, because you're not ready for that yet. Before we can get into what the archetypes actually are, we must first understand what they are based on. And that is two different factors. The first of which being intelligence. Now, hopefully I don't need to explain to you what intelligence is. Hopefully. But for the sake of completionism, intelligence is, of course, how smart you are. Everyone has a brain, and some people's brains are much more effective than others. While there are numerous ways we can try to measure how intelligent someone is, the most commonly used and widely popular method is that of an IQ test, whereby you are tasked with solving numerous different types of problems and then awarded after the fact with an IQ score, based on how well, or God forbid, poorly you did. While there is no universally agreed IQ classification system, the general consensus is that the average IQ score typically falls within the ballpark range of between 90 to 110, with anything below 90 being considered to be relatively low intelligence, and anything above 110 being considered relatively high intelligence. So, what's your IQ? Well, funny story. While making this, I thought it would be fun to ask people I know to take an online IQ test so that we could compare our results for the fun of it. However, we quickly ran into some problems. Firstly, apparently my IQ was 128, making me some sort of super genius, which I can assure you, I am not. But that paled in comparison to my friend, who apparently had an IQ that was greater than that of Albert Einstein. Now, my friend is a pretty smart guy, but not that smart. Needless to say, the online IQ tests are, for the most part, absolute bogus. So if you're ever curious what your IQ is, be sure to actually take a real test instead. Regardless, however, as interesting as IQ scores are, personally, I think those who like to brag about them are honestly losers. And the reason I say that is because IQ, or more accurately, intelligence in general, is determined by a simple equation. Genes multiplied by education both of which are, for the most part, completely out of our hands. I mean, take genes. What control do we have over them? If when your mother was pregnant with you, she decided to smoke five packs of cigarettes a day while living on nothing but blocks of cheese and cans of Fanta, then it wouldn't exactly be your fault if you ended up thinking that one plus one equals TikTok at the age of 35. And it's not much better in education either. You have some people who are absolute mega geniuses, but because they were born into a poor family with very limited opportunities, will likely never be able to use that intelligence to the maximum extent that they otherwise could have. Meanwhile, you also have others who are as dull as the night sky, yet because they were born into a wealthy family, will end up doing much better than they ever deserve to. Boris Johnson. Intelligence, truth be told, is a very difficult thing to truly measure, because life is, to be blunt, not at all meritocratic. Especially in the Western world, whereby such financial oppression is only getting much more profound as time passes. Mainly thanks to the absolute stupidity of our progressives, who only seem to be progressing towards chaos, as well as the absolute uselessness of our conservatives, who seem to be conserving 
absolutely nothing. Don't get off topic, Alex. Don't get off topic. So yeah, intelligence. Pretty simple to understand. Which brings us on to the second factor that I like to call sociability. Sociability essentially means how much someone cares about their society. For example, you have a man who's taken his dog for a walk in the local park, when all of a sudden, his dog takes a giant dump right there in front of him. So, what does he do? Well, if the man had low sociability, then he will simply leave the dump there and not give a damn about it, even if there were other people on the park who would see him do so and judge him for it. This is because those with low sociability do not care at all about their society at large, nor how other people perceive them within it. Basically, they are, as we say in Britain, a cretin. If, however, the man had medium sociability, then he would first look to see if anyone else is around. If there was no one else around, then he would leave it. But if there were others around, then he'd pick it up. This is because those with medium sociability don't necessarily care about the society at large, but they do care about how others perceive them and those they know within it. So essentially, someone who's quite two-faced. But if the man had high sociability, then whether there was other people there or not, he would always pick it up regardless. This is because those with high sociability do actually care about their society at large, as well as how others perceive them within it with the former being much more important, however, than the latter. Cool guys! Essentially, those with low sociability don't care about anyone. Those with medium sociability care only about themselves and perhaps those closest to them, whereas those with high sociability genuinely care about the greater society at large, even at their own personal cost. Simple. And so, if we go back to the Hexagon Matrix, and add intelligence on the y-axis and sociability on the x-axis, labeling each of the three columns and rows as low, medium, and high, then the nine types of people starts to become much more clearer. Someone here would have high intelligence, but low sociability. Someone here would have medium intelligence and medium sociability, whereas someone here would have low intelligence, but high sociability. And all of these possible combinations formulate the nine types of people. And as I said earlier, everyone, including you, will fit into one of these nine archetypes. But which one? Well, let's find out. Starting with inarguably the worst archetype of them all, low intelligence and low sociability. Or, as I like to call them, the dregs. The dregs are pretty much the absolute bottom of the barrel that humanity has to offer. Because of their low intelligence combined with low sociability, they tend to make other people's lives an absolute misery just by their mere presence. Often seen attempting to solve their problems violently and ending up in prison for it. Dregs contribute absolutely nothing to their societies and seemingly only exist to annoy others. They're the kind of people who play loud music on full blast at the back of the bus. The kind of people who engage in endless animalistic one-night stands. The kind of people who would literally steal candy from a baby if they thought they could get away with it. Dregs are the very definition of selfishness incarnate. As if they spawned directly out of hell and somehow ended up here on Earth by accident. The best word to describe them would probably be feral, as they are many things, but civilized is not one of them. Everywhere a dreg goes, they pollute, and whatever they touch inevitably turns to rubbish. All of the other eight archetypes are pretty much in universal agreement that the world would be much better off if the dregs just simply didn't exist. The tragic part about this archetype, however, is that their existence is, more often than not, completely avoidable. Dregs are, for the most part, the result of a combination of bad parenting, bad role models, bad economics, bad opportunities, and bad influences. A healthy society, particularly one of religious significance, will rarely produce any dregs. But a society that actively rewards poor behaviour, or worse, even incentivizes it, will inevitably be overwhelmed by them. Positive traits of the dregs are… not much. I suppose they can be somewhat quite brave, but that's about it. Negative traits of the dregs are that they are prone to crime, incredibly rude, selfish, loud, and worst of all, unapologetically so. We've all met a drag at some point in our lives, and we've all wished that we never did. Which brings us on to the next archetype. Still on low sociability, but this time upping the intelligence to the middle with the empties. If you thought the dregs were a tragedy, wait until you hear about these guys.
Empties, as their name implies, are people who feel empty inside. Unlike the dregs, however, they aren't stupid by any stretch of the imagination, and don't necessarily cause problems for other people. They do, however, cause a lot of problems for themselves. The empties' lack of willpower to do anything with their lives is their ultimate enemy. Empties today can usually be found in their very messy bedrooms, spending their free time playing endless amounts of video games, listening to hypnotic amounts of music, drinking beer, eating garbage, and watching a huge amount of dirty movies. They also tend to have an obsession with anime, for god knows what reason. Anything to distract themselves from the horrors of their daily lives that they are trying to escape. And that really gets to the crux of the empty mindset. Unlike the dregs, it's not that empties don't care about themselves and others, but that they can't. More often than not due to an underlying mental illness, such as depression, paranoia, extreme anxiety, chronic laziness, or unresolved childhood trauma. As such, they tend to waste what intelligence they have, doing absolutely nothing but distracting themselves with products. And because of this complete aversion to personal development, they tend to be absolutely terrible at getting their thoughts across to others, often found communicating via nonsense, such as memes. Many empties, though not all, tend not to look after themselves, hardly ever washing, brushing their teeth, or changing their clothes. Which, naturally, makes them quite prone to loneliness. The only people they really tend to know, excluding the plethora of illusionary online friends of course, is their own parents, who are, more often than not, extremely worried about them. Typically, the only way empties ever turn their lives around and find some purpose is by hitting absolute rock bottom, whereby they are then inspired, one way or another, to change. Many, however, can stay in this infantile state of mind for the rest of their lives, much to their own disappointment. Positive traits of the empties are that they can actually be quite emotionally deep if you get to know them, and don't necessarily cause a lot of problems for others. Negative traits of the empties are that they tend to be addicted to consumerism, often don't look after themselves, can be extremely nihilistic, and most of all, lack the willpower to change. Well, this is depressing so far. How about we have a happy archetype for once? Those who have high intelligence, but still low sociability. AKA, the geniuses. And I'm not talking about those guys who work at the Apple store either. I'm talking real geniuses. Autism is a developmental disorder that varies widely in severity for those who have it. People with autism tend to have huge difficulties communicating with others, as well as understanding other people's emotions, which can, naturally, make life very difficult indeed. Mr. Hexagon? Yes, B. May I read out the symptoms of autism? Hmm, great idea. Go on ahead. According to the British National Health Service, autistic people may find it hard to communicate and interact with other people, find it hard to understand how other people think or feel, find things like bright lights or loud noises overwhelming, stressful or uncomfortable, get anxious or upset about unfamiliar situations and social events, take longer to understand information, and do or think the same things over and over. Uh, yes, well thanks for that B. that was um... Interesting. However, the stereotype that all autistic people simply aren't intelligent is grossly inaccurate. While indeed their lack of social prowess may make it seem as such, on the contrary, there are many autistic people who have not just above average intelligence, but even in some cases, exceptionally high intelligence. And this is exactly what the genius is. Throughout history, there has been people who have been notoriously terrible when it comes to communicating with others, likely caused by some form of autism, but when left to their own devices, are incredibly skilled at whatever it is they are passionate about, due to also having incredibly high intelligence. Albert Einstein, the world-famous physicist and often stereotyped to be the most intelligent person who ever lived, actually displayed a lot of autistic traits, such as having relatively poor social skills, extreme difficulty making friends, and was, as bizarre as it may sound, quite lonely. Yet when left in his lab, he was in his element, and contributed much to mankind's understanding of how the universe works. Michelangelo was one of the world's most prestigious sculptors and painters, and it isn't hard to see why, judging by their sheer magnificence. It is now widely believed that he may too have also been autistic, due to a combination of having almost no social interests, very poor communication skills, and being completely single-minded and obsessive in regards to the quality of his creations. 
Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, apart from having one of the most badass names of all time, is still one of the world's most renowned musicians, even hundreds of years after his death. A child prodigy who started making his tunes at the mere age of five, yet supposedly throughout his life had very erratic mood swings, often made repetitive movements, and apparently was frequently lost inside his own head. All of which are, naturally, signs of autism. This rare but prolific combination of exceptionally high intelligence paired with equally exceptionally low sociability can result in a person who on the surface may seem quite cold and stubborn, but all in all can go on to hugely contribute to whatever field it is that intrigues them in a way that someone with a higher sociability simply wouldn't have the time nor dedication to do so. Positive traits of the geniuses are of course their exceptionally high intelligence, dedication, talents, and massive contributions to their field of interest. Negative traits of the geniuses, however, are their huge stubbornness, single-mindedness, social ineptitude, and often not looking after themselves, in a similar fashion to their empty counterparts. Overall, pretty interesting folks. Alright, so we've covered all of the low sociability archetypes, let's move on now to the middle. Starting with the mix of low intelligence and medium sociability. The Simpletons. A simpleton, as their name implies, are people who are simple. Like the dregs, the simpletons aren't the sharpest tools in the shed, but unlike the dregs, they do care about how others perceive them and their immediate friend and family circle. They tend to keep to themselves and not cause much of a ruckus, their lives pretty much following the exact same cycle of work, leisure, work and leisure. They're the sort of people who, if they're a man, are absolutely obsessed with sports. Hey lad, did you see that bloody match last night? Oh heck, you mean Kickball United versus Score Goal FC? Oh aye, those blokes know how to kick to ball round field, eh? Oh aye. Who are you? Who are you? Or, if they're a woman, are absolutely obsessed with celebrity gossip. OMG, did you see what that cow was wearing at the National Talentless Actor Awards? OMG, that dress was so ghastly. What was she thinking? As I said, simple. They typically don't have any lofty ambitions or dreams and are often satisfied with life so long as they have food in their bellies and, more often than not, a beer in their hands. Love me kids, love me wife, love me mum, simple as. Trying to talk to a simpleton about topics like literature, science, religion, philosophy or anything that can't be found on television is pretty much a fruitless exercise. Despite this, however, simpletons are usually infinitely more friendly than their so-called intellectual counterparts and are ultimately the people that ensure our society stays functioning. Positive traits of the simpletons are that they usually have hearts of gold, being very family oriented, making loyal friends and causing very little trouble. Negative traits of the simpletons are that they're as dumb as a doorpost, have almost zero aspirations of any kind and are incredibly easily distracted. Simple as. Moving swiftly on up, we have the exact centre of each axis, medium intelligence and medium sociability, an archetype that I like to call the NPCs. The NPC is inarguably one of the most popular memes of the last decade. I use it all the time in my productions because I think it's just such a spot on metaphor to describe the type of person I'm referring to. Non-player characters. You ever played a video game where there's computer controlled characters moping about? Yeah. That's an NPC. They can't do anything other than what they've been programmed to do, following a strict set path of tasks of which they can't deviate. The NPC archetype is exactly the same. Average in every way imaginable, these are the people who just do exactly what society tells them to, pretty much 100% of the time. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing, actually. If an NPC lives in a place that promotes good values, such as treating others well, being charitable, and having basic decency, such as, say, the Christian and Islamic civilizations do, then they're pretty much guaranteed to live a pretty good life. However, if an NPC finds themselves in a place that promotes bad values, such as killing your own kids, being greedy, and having zero decency whatsoever, such as say, oh I don't know, modern western civilization, then they're pretty much guaranteed to live an absolutely horrible life. 
The curse of the NPC is that they're smart enough to follow orders, but not smart enough to question them. In today's world, the NPC archetype represents people who are intelligent enough to graduate from higher educational establishments, but aren't intelligent enough to understand why they did it in the first place. They may be aware, deep down, that our culture is in a state of decline and that our economic system isn't functioning whatsoever. But rather than actually delve into the reasons why, they'd rather just blindly go along with whatever the mainstream dogma at the time dictates, foolishly thinking that everything will just work out in the end, much to their own pitfall. Wait, what? You're telling me I did everything society told me to, but still ended up living in an overpriced box that I don't even own? Working 12 hours a day for a bag of peanuts and a can of coke? Yes. Imagine the sort of people who relies on fact-checkers and listens to experts. Their religious, political and philosophical beliefs are all but determined by the Overton window. Despite merely having average intelligence, they mistakenly believe that they have high intelligence, mostly because the wealthy elites of whom they work for keep telling them that they do. Looking down, you'll never see me. Try the sky, cause that'll be me. These people are in their 20s. They're also the type of people who view themselves as being very caring for society at large, despite in reality only really caring about themselves and those around them. Only daring to speak out about societal issues, so long as they are absolutely certain that it's in vogue. Stand up for climate change justice! So brave. NPCs aren't bad people, per se. They're just, well, a conglomeration of no risks, safe opinions, and absolute unfettered blandness. Yeah, that sounds about right. Positive traits of the NPCs are that they can very effectively follow orders and work hard. Negative traits of the NPCs are that they can only follow orders and work hard if it's within societal acceptability to do so. Which brings us on nicely to high intelligence and medium sociability, also known as the psychopaths. When people think of the word psychopath, they tend to imagine an angry madman swinging around an axe, hunting for their next victim. But this stereotype really doesn't correspond at all with reality. Psychopaths aren't raging basket cases who can't control their actions. On the contrary, they tend to be extremely sophisticated, calculated, and cunning. Psychopaths are people whose brains haven't developed properly, and therefore exhibit some major personality deficits. Unlike the geniuses, however, these deficits aren't mostly harmless, as psychopaths can be extremely dangerous people to be around. I'm sure you've seen a photo like this before, which showcases the difference in brain activity between a normal person and a psychopath, with the psychopath showing far less activity in certain parts of the brain than a normal person. But what exactly is going on here? Well, there are three main parts of the brain that are significantly different for psychopaths. First, the amygdala. The amygdala dictates much of our emotions, such as sadness and fear. When psychopaths are shown a series of disturbing images, their amygdala doesn't respond as it should, with their sense of sadness and fear being significantly lower than that of a normal person. In day-to-day -day life, this lack of sadness and fear can result in psychopaths not understanding the severity of certain moral violations, nor properly comprehending societal boundaries, both of which can, naturally, result in heightened criminal activity. Second, the prefrontal cortex. Our prefrontal cortex determines our planning and decision-making abilities. Because psychopaths have a warped prefrontal cortex, they tend not to be able to comprehend the consequences of their actions, resulting in them being far more likely to commit acts that may prove to be costly. Third, the ventral stratum. The ventral stratum is responsible for managing our reward and motivational subsystems. A psychopath's ventral stratum significantly overestimates the instant gratification that their actions pose, making them far more likely to prioritise short-term gains. So yeah, if you haven't got the memo yet, psychopaths are pretty dangerous. 1% of people worldwide are estimated to be psychopaths, though this number is questionable. Regardless of how many there actually are, however, what is known for sure is that psychopaths tend to dominate certain positions in society. Most world leaders, CEOs, and celebrities are almost guaranteed to be psychopaths. This is because the traits required to reach such positions, such as being ultra-competitive, ruthless, and relentless, they tend to excel at, as they often view their fellow humans as mere pawns in their chess game that they can use or discard as they see fit. 
The positive traits of psychopaths are their high intelligence, uncompromising relentlessness, and unrivaled competitive abilities. The negative traits of psychopaths is their lack of sympathy, warped emotional palette, and incredibly dangerous nature. And on that note, I hope you sleep well tonight. <laughs> All right, and on to the final column, starting with low intelligence and high sociability, it's the fanatics. Fanatics, as their name implies, are people who take their beliefs way too far. There are many types of fanatics. Religion, for example, can be taken to quite an illogical extreme. Or even the opposite, the extremely anti-religious, who are often cringeworthy to the point of seeming satire. Politics is another rising realm of fanaticism, composed of people who tend to be either really far left, aka red flag holding Antifa soy boy super soldiers of love and tolerance, or really far right, aka guys with anime ladies as their profile pictures who insult you for no reason. They're everywhere! As hard to believe as it may be, however, from a psychological perspective, fanatics do tend to genuinely care a lot about their societies. They ascribe to their political or religious beliefs with such an uncompromising zeal because they really do think, with a vigorous certainty, that their ideas will make the world a better place, and are willing to do almost anything to implement them. However, it's ironically because of this fanaticism that the general public at large inevitably end up gravitating away from them as to not seem associated, thus tending not to do themselves, or the ideas they adore, any favours. In addition, because they have low intelligence, they typically immensely struggle to understand the opposing views of those whom they believe to be their enemies. And as such, because they don't understand them, they can't relate to them in any meaningful way, and thus tend to demonise, or worse, dehumanise them, in order to justify the retribution they wish to inflict upon them. Essentially, fanatics are people who mean well, but never actually do well. The positive traits of fanatics is their extreme passion, unrivaled dedication, and immense loyalty. The negative traits of fanatics is their low intelligence, lack of understanding, and uncompromising stubborn nature. Balance, people, balance! Which brings us on to a very cool archetype indeed, the mix of medium intelligence with high sociability. The Guardians. Guardians really are just great people. On the intelligence front, there's not much special about them. They aren't geniuses by any stretch of the imagination. But unlike the fanatics, they aren't stupid either. Guardians tend to care a lot about their societies, and are often willing to go against the grain when necessary to try to change it for the better, even at the cost of their own reputations. They tend to see life through a much more nuanced lens, trying to work things out pragmatically as opposed to idealistically. Being free thinkers, Guardians tend to make great diplomats, being the glue that holds the different diasporic groups of society together. This open-mindedness and natural diplomatic nature can sometimes bite them on the backside, however, as in their quest to be as knowledgeable as possible, they can sometimes be far too lenient with people who simply can't be negotiated with. Such as, once again, the fanatics. Guardians tend to be quite understanding, jolly, and pleasant people to be around. They can easily be differentiated from fanatics due to their tolerance towards comedy. They don't mind making a clown out of themselves, or others, so long as it's all in good fun. The positives of the Guardians are that they tend to have a great sense of humour, are very open-minded, while at the same time being very caring. The negatives of the Guardians are that they can sometimes be too submissive to others, overthink things way too much, and can sometimes come across as if they stand for nothing. And finally, drumroll please! Let's finish up with the last and arguably best archetype of them all, high intelligence and high sociability. It's the legends. Ooh. Throughout history, there have been people rising up from seemingly out of nowhere who through a combination of their steely wit and iron determination completely changed the course of human history. For better or worse. The legend is the ultimate form of human being. They look at the world not through the eyes of a spectator, but a sculptor. Through their vast intelligence, they are able to conjure resolutions to the problems of their time, and thanks to their unrivaled sociability, actually have the willpower to implement them. They can either be admired, envied, or hated, but they are certainly known, and their deeds live on throughout the annals of history, long after their departure. For the legends, the weaknesses of all the other nine archetypes are discarded, 
while their strengths are absorbed. They are motivated not by mere wealth, power or fame, but by the strong inner desire to do the right thing. These are the people who change our world, natural born leaders who perform a lifetime of service in the pursuit of a better life. Not just for themselves, but all of the others who follow them. The positives of the legends are, well, pretty much everything. They are smart, charismatic, confident, determined, and the list goes on and on. The negatives of the legends, well, they are one in a million. So, there we have it folks, we have successfully completed The Hexagon Matrix. Behold the nine archetypes. The dregs, the empties, the geniuses, the simpletons, the NPCs, the psychopaths, the fanatics, the guardians, and the legends. Every single person you know will fit into one of these nine archetypes, including yourself. The question you're probably asking yourself, however, is which one? Well, you probably have a rough idea of where you belong, but if not, then different demographics have a much higher chance of being in some archetypes than others. And I'm going to explain how and try to narrow it down for you. Let's start with age. I think it kind of goes without saying that when we're young, we are all very, very stupid. I mean, we're brought into the world and we're peeing ourselves, we're pooping ourselves. I mean, we just don't have a clue what we're doing. But as we get older and our brains start to develop, our intelligence does, of course, hopefully, go up until around the age of around 25. I'm sure you've heard before that the brain isn't fully developed until the age of 25. Absolute nonsense. What people really mean by that is when we are young, our brain has much higher plasticity, meaning that we can take in information much more succinctly. Around 25, however, is when our brain's plasticity stagnates, and thus our natural intelligence pretty much remains the same up until around the age of 65, whereby as our physical body ages, so too does our cognitive abilities. Just ask this guy. Hence why when we're really young, it's very easy for us to say, learn a language. But when we're really old, we massively struggle to learn new things, such as, for example, how to maneuver the latest technology. So yeah, when it comes to intelligence and age, there's a huge rise, a stable stagnation, and a slight fall. And this is pretty much exactly the same when it comes to sociability, with us not giving a damn about anything or anyone else when young, only for us to start to later on, until we reach the end of our lives, whereby it falls down slowly as we mellow with age. Overall, what this tells us is that pretty much everyone starts off life as a dreg, whereby hopefully over time as our brains develop, we all eventually grow out of it into whatever else we become. Alright then, what about gender? When it comes to intelligence, if you were to take every man on Earth and every woman on Earth and force them both to take an IQ test, what you'd find is that the difference in IQ between the genders would be borderline non-existent. Men are not overall more intelligent than women, and women are not overall more intelligent than men. However, that's not to say there aren't any differences between them. Enter variance. Men's IQ tends to form a curve that looks somewhat like a V-shape, with men being overrepresented at both the extreme low IQ and high IQ ends of the spectrum, while at the same time being underrepresented in the middle. Women, on the other hand, are the exact opposite, with their curve forming a sort of N-shape, being underrepresented at both ends of the extreme, but overrepresented in the middle. So essentially, men are kind of like a gamble. There's a much higher chance you may become the next Einstein, but there's also a much higher chance that you could become a complete moron. On the contrary, women tend to be quite balanced in the middle, which can either be a good thing or bad thing, depending on how you look at it. But the difference in variance of intelligence is absolutely nothing compared to the variance in sociability. From my observations, being a man seems to have zero noticeable effect to how sociable said individual will be with men being roughly equally represented across all of the sociability categories. Women, on the other hand, seem to almost universally be drawn to the middle. And this actually makes sense from a biological perspective. Naturally, women will be much less likely to have low sociability due to their maternal instincts, of which are typically much stronger than that of men's paternal instincts. 
There's a reason why, in the event of a divorce, the children are much more likely to live with the mother as opposed to the father. And that's because the bond that mothers have with their children often tends to be quite obsessive, as to ensure their ongoing survival. This is also the case with practically every other mammal in the animal kingdom. Women are also much less likely to have high sociability for this same reason, as to have high sociability often requires taking unnecessary risks. Unnecessary risks that could potentially put not just themselves, but also their offspring, at odds with the hierarchy of the society they live in. Therefore, even if said society may have issues, unless they are stark, biological imperative may dictate that such risks aren't worth taking, so long as their offspring can still grow and prosper. Thus, by the process of elimination, the overrepresentation of women having medium sociability makes complete sense. With that said, however, such overrepresentation in the middle also causes the unintended side effect of men being vastly overrepresented in the low and high sociability categories by mere monopoly. And so, if we look back at the Hexagon Matrix. What we will find is that the archetypes that tend to be both low or high will be almost universally dominated by men, which is both good in some cases and bad in others. The good? Geniuses, with their single-minded fixation on things as opposed to people, overwhelmingly tend to be men. And the legends who transform their societies have also overwhelmingly been men. The bad? The dregs, if we are to judge by the prison population, are overwhelmingly men. And fanatics of all kinds, likewise, overwhelmingly tend to be men. Meanwhile, if we look at that of which is both in the medium, it will almost universally be dominated by women. Which again, can either be a good thing or bad thing, depending on the situation. What this overall means is that when things are going great, you're going to want to listen to the women in general, as they won't want it to change. But when things are going badly, you're going to want to listen to the men in general, as they're going to want to change it. Overall, the variances between men and women are truly fascinating. But the truth is that no gender is outright superior or inferior to the other outright, as if that was the case, from an evolutionary biological perspective, there would only be one. Men and women are both equal, but different, each of us having our own unique strengths and weaknesses that complement each other. Anyone who tries to pretend that we are both identical, or that one is universally flat-out better or worse than the other, is not more than a charlatan, who should be disregarded. And lastly, let's finish it up with political affiliation. When it comes to intelligence, people on the left will say, We're way smarter than those dumb conservatives. Check out our sociology degrees as proof. Whereas people on the right will say, We're grounded in facts and logic, unlike those dumb delusional liberals. But in reality, they're both full of it. Political affiliation is not at all indicative of intelligence, in any way, shape or form. Both sides tend to stereotype the other as thick because they don't see what they see. But the reality is that the reason they don't see what they see isn't because they're dumb, but mostly down to the class system, a rural versus urban divide, and just straight up different life experiences. On the contrary, there are smart people on the left and smart people on the right, and there are dumb people on the left and dumb people on the right. And as for sociability, again, the left will say, Those conservatives only care about themselves. We care about the people. Whereas the right will say, Those liberals are selfish cretins. It's us who protects the nation. But again, absolute nonsense. Both affiliations care a lot about their respective societies, but just simply manifest it in completely different ways. Those on the left are really good at pointing out economic injustices that those on the right tend to ignore, such as wealth inequality, tax avoidance, and corporate corruption. But those on the right are also really good at pointing out cultural problems, such as defending free speech, law and order, and pointing out the hypocrisy of garbage divisive identity politics that those on the left also tend to ignore. Once again, my beloveds, as much as I despise coming across as the smug, enlightened centrist, I'm afraid your sociability is not determined by beliefs that you could change on a whim. So, folks, there we have it. Now, as humorous and light-hearted as I may have presented this, I guarantee from now on as you go about your day-to-day -day life, you'll find yourself subconsciously categorizing people into these nine archetypes. As make no mistake, they are real. Why people act the way they do, and why the world is the way it is, will become abundantly clear to you when you realise just one thing. 
And that one thing is that in reality, humans really aren't all that different after all. Alright folks, I hope you enjoyed that. A bit of an idea that I've had on my mind for quite some time, so I'm finally glad to get this out there. But I am exceptionally curious about what archetype you believe that you fit into. Now I do have a bit of an idea where most of you will probably fit into. If you're in my audience, then it's very likely you're in a high sociability category. And I say that because all my productions are about what? Society. And so, you, you know, in order to make it through half an hour, 40 minute behemoths like this, uh, you know, you, you kind of have to care about society a bit, at least. And so I imagine that a lot of you are either fanatics, guardians, or perhaps even a legend. Who knows, we might have a legend amongst us. And I'd like to give a shout out to the wall of famers as ever. Zoris, 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 I will never get it right. My two pence. Nemesis4534, welcome to you, sir. Ardent Word, Daniel HV, Scott Brown, welcome to you, sir. Andrew Hamrick, Philip M, Scrofu, Scrofulus, Scrofulaus Rex. Where's FR, Bob Page, Denton Cassells, BW Gaming, Matthew East, welcome to you, sir. And Trevor. But yeah, I think it's quite an interesting concept, the hexagon matrix. Uh, it puts it puts a lot of things into perspective, right? When you're interacting with people, it's like, mm, okay, I see, I see what you are. You're you're that archetype. Or maybe it's just star signs for nerds. But either way, I'll see you next time. <laughs>